dear students, I welcome you to yet another lecture on corporate law. The topic of discussion for today's lecture is the Competition Act. In today's lecture, we shall try and understand the salient features of the Competition Act 2002. The Competition Act of 2002 is a piece of legislation that aims to prevent practices having adverse effect on competition, to promote and sustain competition in markets, to protect the interests of consumers and to ensure freedom of trade carried on by other participants in markets in India. The major reason for passing this legislation is to make sure that market competition operates as intended and that customers have access to a broader variety of goods at reasonable cost. Dear students, we shall now try and understand the evolution and development of the competition law in India. India adopted its first competition law way back in 1969 in the form of Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, that is the MRTP Act. The MRTP Bill was introduced in the Parliament in the year 1967 and the same was referred to the Joint Selection Committee. The MRTP Act 1969 came into force with effect from the 1st of June 1970. However, with the advent of globalization, privatization and liberalization, there was felt a necessity to replace the archaic law by the new competition law and hence the MRTP Act was replaced with the Competition Act of 2002. In October 1999, the Government of India constituted a high-level committee under the chairmanship of Mr. S. V. S. Raghavan, which is known as the Raghavan Committee, to suggest a modern competition law for the country in line with international developments and to formulate a legislative framework which may entail a new suitable law or suitable amendments to the MRTP Act 1969. The Raghavan Committee presented its report to the government in May 2000. The committee inter alia noted, and I quote, in conditions of effective competition, rivals have equal opportunities to compete for business on the basis and quality of their outputs and resource deployment follows market success in meeting consumer demands at the lowest possible cost. On the basis of the recommendations of the Raghavan Committee, a draft competition law was prepared and presented in November 2000 to the Government of India and a competition bill was introduced in Parliament which referred the bill to its standing committee. After considering the recommendations of the standing committee, the Parliament passed in December 2002 the Competition Act 2002. Hence, the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, that is, the MRTP Act 1969, was repealed and was replaced by the Competition Act 2002. The Competition Act provides for the establishment of Competition Commission of India, which is a quasi-judicial body bound by the principles of the rule of law in giving decisions and the doctrine of precedence. The Competition Commission of India has all the powers of a civil court for gathering evidence. Besides this, the Act also regulates three anti-competitive behaviours, namely, number one, anti-competitive agreements, number two, abuse of dominant position, number three, mergers and acquisitions, which are in the nature of combinations. Dear students, we shall now try and understand anti-competitive agreements. In the first place, the Competition Act prohibits anti-competitive agreements. Anti-competitive agreements are divided into two categories, namely horizontal agreements and vertical agreements. Horizontal agreements. These are agreements which generally occur between two or more entities or enterprises that stand at par with each other in terms of production, supply, 
distribution, etc. in the same market. For example, an agreement between a manufacturer of a particular commodity of not selling a particular product below the agreed price or for not supplying a product to a particular market would be deemed as a horizontal anti-competitive agreement. Under the Competition Act 2002, the different types of horizontal agreements which are prohibited are agreements which number one directly or indirectly determine the purchase of sale prices that is fixing of prices number two limit or control the production supply markets technical development investment or provision of services number three allocate a specific geographical market area the type of goods or services or number of customers or a source of production that is market sharing number four directly or indirectly result in bid rigging or collusive bidding bid rigging means any agreement which has the effect of eliminating or reducing competition for bids or adversely affecting or manipulating the process for bidding number five agreements in the form of cartels the competition act defines cartel as an association of producers sellers distributors traders or service providers who by agreement amongst themselves limit control or attempt to control the production distribution sale or price of or trade in goods or provision of services thus cartels are anti-competitive in nature they pose a grave danger to competition and ultimately tend to destroy free trade in fact cartels are secret agreements between business firms with the sole objective of fixing prices or sharing markets between them dear students we now try and understand vertical agreements vertical agreements include those agreements which are entered into by two enterprises at different stages of the production for example any agreement between a manufacturer and a wholesaler which can adversely affect competition in the market would be termed as a vertical anti-competitive agreement the competition act 2002 prohibits various types of vertical agreements these are number one tie-in arrangement tie-in arrangement is an agreement which requires a purchaser to purchase some other goods as a condition to purchase the goods that he wants to purchase number two exclusive supply agreement agreements that restrict a purchaser in any manner directly or indirectly from acquiring or dealing in the goods other than those of the seller or of any other person number three exclusive distribution agreement agreements which limit restrict or withhold the output or supply of any goods or allocate the area or market for disposal or sale of the goods number four refusal to deal any agreement that restricts or is likely to restrict any person or class of persons by any method to or from whom the goods can be bought or sold resale price maintenance any agreement that, that in which the price for resale by the purchaser is stipulated by the seller unless it is clearly stated that the prices lower than those prices can be charged according to section 3 of the competition act any agreement in respect of production supply distribution storage acquisition or control of goods or provision of services which causes or is likely to cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition within india shall be wild while determining whether an agreement has an appreciable adverse effect on competition under section 3 the certain factors may be taken into consideration these are a creation of barriers to new entrants in the market b driving existing competitors out of the market c foreclosure of competition 
by hindering entry into the market. D. Accrual of benefits to consumers. E. Improvements in the production or distribution of goods or provision of services. F. Promotion of technical, scientific and economic development by means of production or distribution of goods or provision of services. Dear students, it is also important to remember that agreements which impose reasonable restrictions that restrict or protect infringement of rights as guaranteed under the intellectual property laws are not considered as anti-competitive under the competition law. In the case of Shri Ashok Kumar Sharma versus Agni Devices Private Limited, it was held that a mere restriction on the use of the trademark would not be held as anti-competitive within the meaning of Section 3 or 4 of the Act. Dear students, we now try and understand abuse of dominant position as provided under Section 4 of the Competition Act 2002. In order to assess whether an enterprise has abused its dominant position, it is essential to understand number one the relevant market number two to determine whether the company or the firm or the enterprise concerned is in a dominant position in the relevant market number three to determine whether the conduct of the company in a dominant position has led to the abuse of its dominant position dear students we now try and understand the meaning of relevant market for determining whether a market constitutes a relevant market for the purposes of the Competition Act, we need to understand the concept of relevant geographic market and relevant product market. Relevant geographic market. While determining relevant geographic market, certain factors need to be taken into account. These are A. Regulatory trade barriers b local specification requirements c national procurement policies d adequate distribution facilities e transport costs f language g consumer preferences h need for secure or regular supplies or rapid after sales services dear students we now discuss relevant product market while determining the relevant product market, due regard needs to be paid to all factors such as a. Physical characteristics or end use of the goods b. Price of the goods or services c. Consumer preferences d. Exclusion of in-house production e. Existence of specialized producers f classification of industrial products dear students we now try and understand dominant position dominant position means a position of strength enjoyed by an enterprise in the relevant market in India which enables it to number one operate independently of competitive forces prevailing in the relevant market number two affects its competitors or consumers of the relevant market in its favor. Dear students, we shall now try and understand the factors which help us to determine the dominant position. Dominance has been usually characterized as a part of the market share of the enterprise. The different elements which help us to ascertain the dominant position of an enterprise are number one, the market share of the enterprise. Number two, the size and resources of the enterprise. Number three, the size and importance of the competitors. Number four, economic power of the enterprise, including commercial advantages over competitors. Number five, vertical integration of the enterprises or sale or service networks of such enterprises. Number six, dependence of the consumers on the enterprise. Number seven, Monopoly or dominant position, whether acquired as a result of any statute or by virtue of being a government company or a public sector undertaking or otherwise. Number eight, 
entry barriers, including barriers such as regulatory barriers, financial risks, high capital cost of entry, marketing entry barriers, technical entry barriers, economies of sale, high cost of substitutable goods or services for the consumers. Number nine, countervailing buying power. Number 10, market structure and size of the market. Number 11, social obligations and social costs. Number 12, relative advantage by way of contribution to the economic development by the enterprise enjoying a dominant position having or likely to have an appreciable adverse effect on competition. Lastly, any other factor which the Commission may consider relevant for the inquiry. Dear students, we now understand what is meant by the abuse of dominant position. An abuse of dominant position occurs when an enterprise in a dominant position performs certain acts. These are directly or indirectly imposes unfair or discriminatory practices. One example of unfair practice would be predatory pricing. Predatory price means selling of goods at a price which is below the cost of production of goods or provisions of service in order to eliminate competitors or to reduce competition. The Competition Commission of India Determination of Cost of Production Regulations 2009 have been enacted for the determination of predatory pricing cost. According to Regulation 3, Clause 1, average variable cost will generally be taken as a proxy for marginal cost. Number 2. Abuse of dominant position also results when an agreement limits or restricts production of goods or provision of any services in any form, indulges in practice or practices resulting in denial of market excess, makes conclusion of contracts subject to acceptance by other parties of supplementary obligations which have no connection with the subject of such contracts or uses its dominant position in one relevant market to enter into or protect other relevant markets. Dear students, we shall now take an example to understand the abuse of dominant position. In Bharti Airtel versus Reliance Geo, in 2017, Bharti Airtel had filed a complaint against Reliance Geo with the Competition Commission of India, accusing it of abusing its dominant position by way of predatory pricing. Airtel, which was the top market player with the maximum market share before Reliance Geo came about and its net profit dropped by 54% from 2016 to 2017. Reliance Geo had started the price point of zero, which was absolutely below the cost and had garnered over 72 million subscribers, overtaking Airtel and becoming the top market player. The question here was whether Reliance Geo's zero pricing amounted to predatory pricing and further to abuse of dominant position. The Competition Commission of India rejected the complaint of Airtel, stated that in order for a company to abuse its dominant position, it must already have a dominant position which Reliance Geo lacked in this case as it was a new entrant in the market and a new entrant cannot have a dominant position in the market and hence cannot be accused of predatory pricing. Another example before us would be that of the Competition Commission of India which imposed a penalty of Rs 1337.76 crore on Google for abusing its dominant position in multiple markets in the Android mobile device ecosystem, apart from issuing a cease and desist order. In its order in October 2022, related to an investigation into Google that was started in April 2019, 
based on a complaint that Google was abusing its Android platform to shut out its rivals. The order also spotlighted the fact that Google dominated multiple aspects of the market, including relationships with device manufacturers, general web search, the App Store, and Google products such as Chrome, Browser, and YouTube. The Competition Commission of India found that Google enforced multiple restrictive agreements with mobile device manufacturers that guaranteed that distribution channels for competing search services are altogether eliminated by prohibiting original equipment manufacturers, that is OEMs, from offering devices based on Android forks. It ensured that OEMs are not able to develop and or offer devices based on forks which are outside the control of Google. The third area of focus of competition law is the regulation of combinations. The Competition Act regulates mainly three types of combinations, namely, number one, acquisition of shares, voting rights or assets of another entity by a person or an enterprise. Number two, individuals acquiring control over an enterprise. Number three, merger or amalgamation between or amongst businesses. The Act under Section 6 provides that no person or enterprise shall enter into a combination which causes or is likely to cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition within the relevant market in India and such a combination shall be what? An important point to remember is that an acquisition, share subscription or financing facility provided by a public financial institution, foreign institutional investor, bank or venture capital fund pursuant to any covenant of loan agreement or an investment agreement is exempt from the provisions of Section 6. Regulation of Combination Section 5 of the Competition Act provides for the regulation of combinations by providing certain threshold limits below which combinations would not be covered under the scanner of the Competition Act. The rationale behind prescribing such limits can be the reason that combinations behind small enterprises or entities may not significantly harm competition in Indian marketplaces. The limits so provided under Section 5 of the Act are explained. Number 1. In case of acquisition of share, voting rights or acquiring the control, the person acquiring the shares and the enterprise whose shares, assets or voting rights are acquired jointly have Number one, assets in India, more than 1,000 crores. Turnover, more than 3,000 crores. Number two, aggregate assets in India or outside India should be more than $500 million, including at least 500 crores in India. Turnover of more than $1,500 million, including at least 1,500 crores in India. In case of acquisition by a group, the joint assets and such acquiring group should be assets in India, more than 4,000 crores, turnover, more than 12,000 crores. Aggregate assets in India and outside India, more than $2 billion, including at least 500 crores in India. Turnover, more than $6 billion, including at least 1,500 crores in India. Secondly, in case of merger or amalgamation, the remaining enterprise after the merger or the enterprise so created after amalgamation should have assets in India more than 1,000 crores, turnover more than 3,000 crores, aggregate assets outside India $500 million, including at least 500 crores in India, turnover more than $1,500 million, including at least 1,500 crores in India. If the enterprise so created after the amalgamation or remaining after the merger belongs to a group, then such group should have assets in India, 
more than 4,000 crores, turnover more than 12,000 crores. Aggregate assets in India and outside India, 2 billion US dollars. Turnover more than 6 billion US dollars, including at least 1,500 crores in India. Importantly, the provisions of the regulations for combinations are covered under Section 6 of the Act. It provides that within 30 days of the execution of any acquisition instrument or the Board of Directors' acceptance of the request for amalgamation or merger, the Competition Commission must be notified in writing of the details of the proposed combination along with the required costs. The time period prescribed for the combination to take effect is 210 days after giving of notice to the Competition Commission or the date on which the Commission has rendered any order with respect to that notice, whichever is earlier. Dear students, this is all with regard to today's lecture on the Competition Act. In today's lecture, we try to understand the various kinds of anti-competitive practices. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Stay blessed.